said, the one regret I have is that we didn't teach the young. And I think that in a lot of ways uh, I'm a living example of that because I didn't know this story of determination and passion and risk. I want to tell their story. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Good morning, and welcome to Maritime Magazine. I'm Pauline Dakin. The story of the Antigonish Cooperative Movement is familiar to many of us. It started at St. Francis Xavier University and grew out of the work of Father Moses Cody and Father Jimmy Tompkins in the 1920s and 30s. They were looking for ways to help miners and farmers and fishermen out of poverty to help them achieve some independence and autonomy in their own communities. One of the key figures in the movement, and Father Jimmy's right-hand man, was Joseph Laban from Reserve Mines, Cape Breton. Lindsay Kite grew up there, but no one ever told her the story of the movement or how closely its history was intertwined with her own life. A few years ago, she decided to use her art to bring the Antigonish movement to life for a new generation of Canadians. This morning, we have Lindsay's account, in her own words, of how that process also brought her ancestors closer to her. This is Journey to Tompkinsville. Building a new society is as much the common man's business as digging coal, catching fish, or planting seed. If he does not bestir himself to bring it about, no one else will. One moment thinking differently. One moment is all you need. One moment for you to wake up and dream. No one's got a ticket to the stars, so you'll just have to reach. Hi, my name is Lindsay Kite, and I'm a third generation native of Reserve Mines, Cape Breton. And I'm an actor and a writer who's currently living in Toronto, but I try to get home as often as possible. The project that we're working on uh, is, is based, of course, on true events. On so true in events. 2007, I got a call from Festival Antigonish in Nova Scotia um, to be in a play that I'd written called Toronto Adventures. So I traveled back home and rehearsed the play. And on the opening night, uh, because it was a play I'd written, because it was an autobiographical play, and because I was in it, I had a triple set of nerves. And so in the day, in order to relax, I decided to just prowl about the libraries of Antigonish and try to take my mind off of the impending night. And I walked in the community library and I saw pictures of Father Jimmy Tompkins and I saw pictures of Father Moses Cody. Now, everything in Reserve Mines is named after Father Tompkins. The, there's the Tompkins Memorial Library. The elementary school, which I went to, is Tompkins Memorial Elementary. Even the building that the Tim Hortons is in is the Tompkins Complex. And I knew he was a priest and I knew he was important somehow to my community, but I'm ashamed to say I actually didn't know his story. And I thought, okay, it's time to find out exactly what this story was. So I picked up a book, and I opened it up, and the first thing I saw was a picture of my great-uncle Joe and great-aunt Mary. And I knew that they had something to do with cooperatives, and I had a light idea of what cooperatives were. I knew that they had been part of building Tompkinsville. Now, Tompkinsville is a street in Reserve Mines. I grew up right across the street from it. If Tompkinsville continued across the highway, it would be my street, Sunnyside Street. And I knew that Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary had done something kind of important. There were reporters at Uncle Joe's house a lot. 1,200 people in Nova Scotia have managed to beat the housing shortage through cooperative housing. It developed through the Extension Department of St. Francis Xavier University. Len Kosh of the CBC in Sydney interviews Mr. Laban, a field worker for the Extension Department of the University and a specialist in housing. Mr. Laban, how did the cooperative housing start in Nova Scotia? Cooperative housing started in reserve mines by ten coal miners. These I was so young when Uncle Joe was alive that it just seemed like boring adult talk to me, and I never really bothered to find out the story. So I opened up this book in the Antigonish Library, and there are their pictures, and I thought... These people, my own relatives, have done amazing things that I know nothing about. So I started to investigate the story. And what a story it was. 
in the eyes of those at the top, farmers, fishermen, and coal miners don't need education. As a matter of fact, they would be much easier to handle without it. The coal company basically had this community by its throat. Their pay was a system of checkoffs, and the company would deduct their rent, their food, uh, payments for the church from their pay, and the miners had no sense of their own freedom, no sense of dignity, no sense of being a person. In 1935, this priest called Father Jimmy Tompkins arrived in the parish, took one look around at his parishioners and thought, something here has to change. These people are not living a good and abundant life. And he set about making those changes in his very own special way by instilling um, a sense of not only dignity, but uh, the importance of adult education and cooperatives as being the keys to freedom. Um, he, was, he was quite a character, Father Jimmy. He was about... Five foot four, he had piercing blue eyes. He was 65 when he arrived in reserve mines. Very frail man, but also full of fierce determination and fire. And basically the way he got people to do things was he would nag them and buttonhole them and show up in the most inappropriate places for a priest to be, such as at the bootleggers or at your home. And so he not only buttonholed people on the street individually, but he would also preach adult education from the pulpit. Um, when you went for a confession, he would not assign you the rosary, but he would assign you books to read as your penance. So basically to get Father Jimmy off of their backs, people started to read. And he started a library in his glee. Eventually, on Saturday nights, the whole library was packed with miners reading books about economics and cooperatives and agriculture. And as their minds were being opened up to new possibilities, Father Jimmy set up study clubs so people could actualize these possibilities. So people started to see ways they could improve their own lives, and big changes started to happen, and all of a sudden the whole world was reading about reserve minds because it became a very self-sufficient community. For instance, one of their major problems was that they had to go to what was called in the slang of the time the Pluck Me, which was the company store. And the company store charged just exorbitant prices for their food, and the food was not of good quality. So Father Jimmy proposed to a study club one night, well, why don't you have a community garden? And they said, well, we don't, we're don't. we miners, we're not farmers, we don't know how to do that. Father Jimmy said, all right, here are 12 books about agriculture. I'll get Father Cody and Anna Ganesh to send us 12 more. And pretty soon they had 75 acres of land. Um, they were farming, they grew their own vegetables, they got some livestock, and they didn't have to buy their food at the company store anymore. That was just one of the changes. Get up, Joe Lady, move to Cape Breton when we were three. Son of the German. Come from away, man, he'd always be. So when Father Jimmy arrived in 1935 in Reserve Mines, he found my Uncle Joe, who was in his early 30s then, about 31 or 32, and Uncle Joe was a coal miner with a grade 3 education. But he had a photographic memory, and when he married my Aunt Mary, he couldn't read or write, and she taught him to read or write, and... He was learning arithmetic, and Father Cody had come a couple of years before and set up the first credit union, and Uncle Joe was the president. So once Father Jimmy got his eyes on Uncle Joe, he thought, here's some potential, here's a guy I could nag, and Uncle Joe was smart enough to see an opportunity when, when it came along and became Father Jimmy's right-hand man. There was a study club that met every Sunday at Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary's house. So every Sunday evening after Mass, There'd be nine or ten or eleven to arrive at my little house in Belgium. And they call themselves the Toad Lane Study Club, which was named after the Rochdale Cooperative Movement in England, which happened in 1844 with a series of textile mills. They were studying the principles of cooperatives. And so the Toad Lane Study Club conceived of the cooperative garden. Um, they also started a pottery barn. As things were happening, Uncle Joe was reading a book by Warbasse, and 
in and in more Bessie's book, Bessie it that. said that everybody that paid rent to a landlord donated a house back every 20 years to the person. Mm -hmm. So everybody was living in the coal company house. And Uncle Joe thought, nope, that is not right. So he got this ridiculous idea and proposed it to his study club. They were all miners. None of them ever had a hammer in their hand in their life. Why don't we build our own houses together? Now, this had never been done in North America. And half of the people said, you're crazy, Joe. This could never happen. But, of course, Father Jimmy, any time a new idea came along, Father Jimmy was filled with this fire and this fuel and wanted to act on it immediately. And Father Jimmy said, I don't see why it can't happen. Let's do it. But the problem was, Nobody had done it before. There was no expert to train them this time. There were no books on how to build your own houses. And so they tried for a little while uh, to get something going, and their usual sources of support drew out. So there was a conference coming up at St. Avex University, and Father Jimmy said to Uncle Joe, why don't you go and speak to these people about what we're trying to do here? So bravely, Uncle Joe stepped on the podium and told them the story of what the miners were trying to do in reserve mines. And afterwards, this woman came up to him, and her name was Mary Arnold. And Mary Arnold was a cooperative expert from New York. She actually worked for Warabase. She was on the Cooperative League of America. And she said to him, I've been inspired by your story. I came here looking for inspiration, and I think I found it in your story and in Father Jimmy. And I'd like to go for one night to reserve mines and meet Father Jimmy. So he brought Mary Arnold to Reserve Lines. She met Father Jimmy, and Father Jimmy convinced her to stay and lead these families in the first cooperative housing project in North America. And three years later, in 1938, stood 11 houses built by the miners themselves, built by my Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary. This group decided to do something about it, and they did. Today, we have 250 families in 21 cooperative housing groups. So that's my great uncle Joe, Joe Laban. Oh, you do what you can just to get by. In school till age then down to the gates of the company mine. Done with me. Uncle Joe went on to write the book on cooperative housing. He led cooperatives all over Canada. Anyone who has a job and is in need of a home may join a cooperative housing group, providing, however, he is a decent citizen. We have in our groups men from all walks of life, from coal miners to executive men. These people, my relatives, I grew up having Christmas dinner in their house. Uncle Joe used to tell us stories, bedtime stories when I was young. These people were social justice pioneers who took their own lives in their hands and freed themselves from the clutches of the coal company. Lovely Mary Steele, with her siblings at her heels, she'd always been the one to care for them. The boss blacksmith's daughter could have killed her. After I discovered this story in Antigonish, I decided to pitch this story to Festival Antigonish as a play. And I took it to Ed Thomason, who is the artistic director, and I said, um, I'm from Reserve Minds, as you know, but uh, I, I, I'm discovering the story um, of Reserve Minds. I'm Joe Laban's great niece. And at that point, he stopped me. The challenge always when you're uh, developing a project that is about uh, a true story or, or, or a historical uh, event is uh, what is your way into it? How, how do you make a, a connection, a special connection? Uh, and it's not always given to writers to ha have a special connection. But, but in this case, there is a, a special connection. And he looked at me and he said, you're Joe Laban's great niece? And I said, yes. And he said, why didn't you tell me this before? And Ed Thomason hauled out a book about Father Jimmy from his shelf and said, I have been looking for someone to tell this story since I got to Antigonish. And you're telling me that you are Joe Laban's great niece and you're from Reserve Mines? So Ed was really excited about this possibility. And I also approached my good friend Ian Sherwood, who's a singer-songwriter, who had written the music for my play Toronto Adventures. Now, Ian's family is from Reserve Mines originally, 
And um, his grandmother was Winnie Prothero, who was a singer-songwriter who wrote the song Herring and Potatoes. And so I approached Ian with this, this story, and I said, do you think you could write this music, and do you think we could possibly use your grandmother's song in this play? And we sat back and we thought about how neat it was that the generations of our family had achieved these things before us. And here we were, generations later, writing their stories and telling their stories and singing their songs. I found a job in Myra, it's where I met Elvira, so now she's Mrs. Ira, and we're happy as can be. Just had supper cooking when a girl arrived from Brooklyn, and you ought to see her look when she saw what we had for tea. It was herring and potatoes, good herring and potatoes. Herring and potatoes are good enough for me. Herring and potatoes, herring and potatoes, herring and potatoes are good enough for me. I began my research at the Beaton Institute at Cape Breton University, and it was just an amazing process to actually have in my hands Uncle Joe's letters and Father Jimmy's letters and Mary Arnold's letters, and all of a sudden I started to get a sense of them as people rather than just figures who were involved in these events. So I got a sense of their spirit. And I think my neatest moment in researching at the Beaton Institute was when I requested a photo album marked Cooperative Housing, and I opened it up and out of the back fell a picture and I picked it up and it was a picture of me and my cousins sitting around Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary's kitchen table and I was about two years old and I thought I have always been part of this story and I I didn't even realize when I was in Cape Breton researching I would spend my days at the Beaton Institute and at night I would go home and go through my notes and start to write the first draft And so I was in my childhood bedroom at my parents' home on Sunnyside Street in Reserve Mines and writing away at this desk where I've written my whole life. And my dad popped his head in the room and he says, are you writing Tompkins still? And I said, yeah. And he said, you do realize that you're writing on Uncle Joe's desk. And I said, would this desk have been in his home in 1935? And dad said, yep. So I sat back and realized I was writing the story of the first cooperative housing project in North America on the very desk where the study club had conceived of it. And again, it was that sense of, I am meant to be doing this. So I returned from my research to Toronto and I started to write the play and I was really struggling to find the story uh, within all of these events. It seemed to me that it was me that needed to change. I needed to do something to develop my skills as a storyteller. I needed to be able to go uh, deeper and be able to tell a richer story. And so one night on a whim, I decided that I wanted to apply for a master's of acting and I researched some programs and I found program at the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts in England, in Liverpool, uh, which was founded by Paul McCartney, which is pretty neat, and I applied. Then I promptly forgot about it. I was reading a lot of books about Rochdale, England, the home of the cooperative movement, about what those people had achieved in 1844. One morning at 7 a.m., my phone rang, and I didn't answer it, and when I got up, there was a voice on my cell phone that said, your acceptance letter has been returned. Can you please contact us? And I thought, who is this on my phone that sounds like Ringo Starr? And I got, had gotten an email as well that I had gotten into LIPA, the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts, and my acceptance letter had been sent to the wrong address and had been returned. And this was now a couple of months later, and I thought, well, no, I, I can't go there. I can't spend a year doing this because I have to write Tompkinsville. So I turned them down, and they got back to me and said, do you know that we are 40 minutes from Rochdale, which is the home of the cooperative movement in the world, and that we will workshop your play as part of your Masters of Acting if you decide to attend LIPA? And I was sitting at my desk when I got this email, and there were three books about Rochdale on my desk. And I looked at the ceiling, and I said, All right, Father Jimmy, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. You know those houses with indoor plumbing all over the side? Why do you have to wash outside? Father, you have a way of sneaking up on people, don't you? 
You can have it all, Joe. I mean, you're poor enough to want it, and you're smart enough to do it. My wife's certainly smart enough. You know, I have books over the library that you can... Uh, Father, sorry, can you grab, grab me a towel? I've got cold dust in my eyes. Uh, when I got to England, it was amazing. It was amazing being at the school. It was amazing having this creative community around me. But the thing was, nobody knew anything about my play when I got to England. And it all came to a head one day, and I just burst into tears in class. And I'm not a crier. And I cried, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, because I had moved across the world to develop this play, and nobody knew anything about it. And I thought, I've made the wrong choice. I've spent a lot of money to be here. None of my funding had come through for the play. And this is all going shambles. And so in, within that class, when I burst into tears, I mentally booked my ticket back home to Nova Scotia. And as I was leaving, one of my classmates grabbed me, and she said, you're not going back. And I said, how did you know that? And she said, I saw that happen in your eyes. And she said, we are going to workshop this play together, we, your classmates. Uh, we'll find a way to do this. There is a way, and we're going to find it, which is one of the things that Father Jimmy said all the time. There is a way. The Lord helps those who help themselves. So this lovely group of my classmates met bi-weekly on Sundays and workshopped this play outside of class time. They're robbing us blind, nothing but crooks. Pirates. Greedy bastards. Well, they're just giving us a free kick at Christmas. And these people were giving up their time on Sundays because they believed in the play and because they believed in me and they believed in the story. And so it resulted in that December we had a staged reading at the Pilgrim Pub in Liverpool. They got them on us. We got to buy our food from them, rent our houses from them. Pain and blood and sweat for woody turnips and shacks. You wouldn't let a dog sleep in. Shacks we don't even own. Nothing we can call we're ours. We're not even people to them. So I looked around as this reading was going on, and we had people from Ireland, people from England, people from Norway, people from America, all coming together and telling the story of my community and my family and my island. And they were inspired by it. They were constantly inspired in this process and inspired me. And I thought, yep, yeah, this is definitely what I'm supposed to do. Sort of, yeah. Mary, what do you think? No, he's saying that if we work together, we can be a force rather than standing alone and being small. Well, look, there's no way the coal company is going to be shaking in the boots over a bunch of dirty faces oh, and a lie. you stop trying to fight and listen to me? Take your energy and use it where you can do something. So I don't want this to be in conventional theatre spaces. I want this to be in fire halls. I want this to be in community spaces. And I want it to be a community production. So the group of actors comes in and immediately becomes part of the community. So they teach courses on the Anaganish movement at schools. They help out in community gardens. And they get to know the people. And I even thought of having people donate pieces for set pieces. So, oh, that's so-and-so's rug, and look at so-and-so's lamp up there, and oh my goodness, this, this is our production. And so I want people to have a sense, first of all, of theater as not being exclusive or high art, but this is theater for the people, and I want people to have a sense of this being our story and our family and a, a reality, somebody's reality, and a reality that we all share and we've all built on. And I want people to watch this and think, if they did it, I can do it. One small taste of a victory, one small break from your history, one small hope can be huge if you give it what it needs. If you can dream it, you can do it, you can do it, you just have to. Ideas are more powerful than bullets. Look beside you and see your fellow man. Look to heaven and see a generous and giving God. Look to education and you will see your own potential. For it is education and cooperation that are the keys to the good and abundant life. If one person could stop a war if one notion could save the world if one day you knew that you could make a change would you try a little more 
If you can dream it, you can do it. You can do it, it's been proven before. Oh, you can pray until your face turns blue. Oh, he will show you what you're supposed to do, but the rest is up to you. Rest is up to you. Rest is up to you. Lindsay Kite is a writer and actor originally from Reserve Mines, Cape Breton. Her story this morning was produced by Fliss McGregor and Christina Harnett. Our thanks to Ed Thomason and the actors at Festival Antigonish for providing some of the voices in our documentary. We'd also like to thank Richard McKinnon, head of the Center for Cape Breton Studies at Cape Breton University, for providing the archive tape of Mary Laban. And singer-songwriter Ian Sherwood for letting us use the songs he produced for Lindsay's play. Lindsay has just completed another draft of Tompkinsville, and it will have a public reading in Toronto in early December. After that, she'll be ready to bring it on home to the Maritimes and hopefully to a stage near you. We will let you know the dates and the times when they're available. That is all the time that we have for Maritime Magazine this week. I'm Pauline Dakin. Thank you for listening.